Hi there! Chances are, if you're in the know about competitive Super Smash Bros., you might have heard rumblings from your friends about this hit new game called Rivals of Ether. The upcoming release of the definitive edition of Rivals of Ether, as well as the accompanying Switch port, are both expected to bring in a fresh crop of players into the game. As such, I'll be presenting this video series to serve as a primer for people who currently play Smash competitively, or who otherwise have an existing interest in platform fighters, and are interested in giving Rivals of Ether a try. This video series will be broken up into four parts. In this part, part one, we'll be taking a look at what exactly Rivals of Ether is, and talk about why you might want to give it a shot. In part two, we'll dive deeper into how Rivals stands out on a technical level. We'll be going over game mechanics and other details that shape how Rivals plays. In part three, we'll take a look at the playable roster. We'll be going through a brief overview on how each character plays and what makes them stand out from the rest of the cast. And finally, in part four, we'll get an introduction to the community. We'll be going over Rivals' presence on platforms like Discord, as well as some details on the tournament scene. So, let's get started! First of all, in case you're not familiar with what Rivals of Ether is, let's go over a brief history of the game. Created by a team of independent developers led by Dan Fernacy, Rivals of Ether first came into the world in June 2015 via Steam Greenlight, and saw an early access release in September of that year. From these early days, a competitive scene began to take shape, primarily through frequent online tournaments. Soon after, the Rivals Championship Series, or RCS, began to take shape as Rivals' main competitive circuit, and a few local events began to really get attention as well, including a strong showing as a side event at Genesis 4. Fast forward to March 2017, and Rivals of Ether has seen a proper release on Steam. The competitive scene has begun to fully transition to a more traditional, offline-centric season structure, and Rivals events continue to go in size, with large brackets to be held at events like Genesis, CEO Dreamland, Smash and Splash, Super Smash Con, and many others. Rivals exclusive events began to really take shape as well, thanks to grassroots efforts such as Heatwave and other local independent tournaments. DLC characters also began to be introduced around this time, and hype around the game swelled with each passing release, including the release of guest characters Ori from Ori and the Blind Forest, and Shovel Knight from the series of the same name. In 2019, Rivals of Ether introduced Steam Workshop support, allowing people to submit their own creations online for other people to play with, including custom characters and stages. With so many eyes drawn to the creations of these talented artists and programmers who are sharing their work with the world, interest in the game spiked considerably, with loads of new players joining the scene around this time. If you want to learn more about the history of Rivals of Ether, Action Esports recently put out an excellent documentary going over the game's life as an esport, as well as more details on the story behind its development. There's a link to that in the description below. Also, as a quick side note, there is a growing scene based on competitive Steam Workshop content, but I'm not going to be going over that in this series. I'm only going to be focusing on the core content from here on out. Now, in 2020, Rivals of Ether fans are excitedly awaiting the release of Rivals of Ether's Definitive Edition. Rivals of Ether's Definitive Edition is an upcoming large-scale free update for the base game. In addition to coming with all of the DLC characters and stages for no additional cost, it's bringing a lot of new features to the game, including a revamp to online play, with new netcode and a new lobby system allowing for four-player online matches, new cosmetics such as character skins and buddies, a new tetherball game mode, and more. This will be the version of Rivals coming to the Switch, so all the new content will be available there as well, barring only the Steam version's Steam Workshop support. Before we talk about what makes Rivals so special, i like to quickly touch on the different controller options that you have for playing the game at tournaments. For the Steam release, pretty much anything goes, as long as it can plug in and work without much hassle, and doesn't have any obvious cheating capabilities like macros or turbo modes. The most common controllers people use are either GameCube controllers via a Mayflash adapter, or Xbox controllers. In addition, there are good chunks of the player base who play on DualShock 4, Switch Pro Controller, and even Keyboard. As for the Switch version, GameCube controllers will be natively supported with a standard adapter, and any other controller commonly seen in games like Smash Ultimate should be just fine as well. There's players at all levels of play who use all sorts of different controller options, so just use whatever is comfortable for you, and you should be good to go. So, with all that preamble out of the way, let's get into the big question of this video. Why play Rivals? Well first, let me offer a point that doesn't even have to do with how one game may or may not be better than another. I came to Rivals of Ether from Smash 4. 
and there is a good amount of time that I spent going back and forth between the two games. Later on, going back and forth between Rivals and Ultimate when that game dropped a while back. Completely disregarding the merits that each of these games have on a competitive level, something that learning each of these games has taught me is how to broaden my understanding of fighting games in general. I'll touch on this a bit more in part 2 of this series, but the skills that you can learn from playing and learning new fighting games can be invaluable for your growth as a player. By being presented with a new perspective on how a platform fighter can be played, your gameplay across all the titles that you compete in can be enriched quite a bit. In particular, I'd like to bring up this clip from Melee Veteran PPMD's stream, where he explains something that he dubs the beginner's mindset. So when people start playing, what normally happens is they're very flexible and everything is exciting and interesting. And when they lose, they're not judging themselves because they just started. They're like, oh, okay, what can I learn from that? What can this person tell me? Uh, but eventually, like, people get some things that are successful with and they just do those things. They stop being flexible. They stop asking for advice. They get too involved, and then when they lose, they judge themselves, they get angry, they get sad, whatever. So returning to the beginner's mindset is really powerful. As he explains, when you're new to learning something, you'll often be a better learner. So if nothing else, giving Rivals a try and seeing what it has to offer might be a good experience if you plan on playing more fighting games in the future. You might learn a thing or two after a fresh experience like this one. Now, let's get more into what Rivals specifically has to offer. Rivals of Aether definitely has a fairly small roster, especially if you're coming from Ultimate, coming in at just 14 characters. One might see that small size and think that the cast doesn't have a whole lot to offer, but in practice, this is offset by the amount of depth that each character has, and how much each one stands out from the rest of the cast. Each character has a vast palette of options and unique mechanics which all synergize with themselves in creative ways. Every character has some sort of key feature or resource that forms the foundation of their kit, and which is deeply integrated into their game plan. This can manifest into their offense through unique attacks, or by creating some sort of stage control element, or by applying special conditions to themselves or their opponent, etc. Compare this to Smash, and you just won't find the same types of manipulation and interactivity in most characters' movesets. That's not to say that Smash doesn't have depth in other ways, but especially if you look at characters whose designs were settled on in earlier titles, a lot of these characters' toolkits just feel rather simple in comparison. In contrast, there's a lot to unpack in each and every Rivals character, so no matter who you pick, you'll be rewarded with a satisfying bounty of things to discover and experiment with. So if you're worried about not finding a character who can do things that you enjoy, with how much each character has going for them and how much that they all can do, I wouldn't be too worried about it. Give everyone a whirl and see what you find. You might be pleasantly surprised. Also, we'll be taking a closer look at what makes all of these characters special in Part 3, so stay tuned for that! Something that I personally hear a lot from newer players is that, even with just your basic Smash fundamentals, you can often jump in and feel like you're doing some really cool stuff right out of the gate, even if you've never played before. There's a lot of factors of this game's design that I think contribute to this feeling, but one of the biggest tenets of Rivals' game design that I feel contributes to what makes it such a fun game to learn is how accessible its complexity is. Now, I understand that for some of you watching, it might be a bit worrying to hear about this push for quote-unquote accessibility, which has earned a reputation for causing games to get dumbed down or brought about some oversimplification of an existing game formula just for the sake of trying to get more mainstream appeal. However, Rivals is pretty smart with how it applies this accessibility. It keeps many of the broad strokes of what you need to succeed in Smash. Things like good fundamentals, positioning, how to use certain moves effectively, the mental game, etc. But it changes a number of the mechanical tolerances under the hood in regards to certain advanced techniques. Some of these changes are quite significant, but others are much more subtle. One of the general design goals of these tweaks was to take many of the techniques that have become essentials in a game like Melee, things like advanced movement, lag reduction, etc., and make them easier to digest for newer players while keeping the depth that these options can tap into, either by loosening up the mechanical requirements or by redesigning certain aspects of gameplay entirely. In short, the basic ingredients of a more intricate platform fighter, especially something like Melee or Project M, are essentially intact, but players can start applying these tools much easier, and thus get to a point where they can really enrich their game plan even faster. On top of making these more bottom-line aspects of a platform fighter much more accessible, Rivals complements this simplicity by adding depth in new areas, such as by adding its own techniques on top of the existing platform fighter core, and by doing really creative things with the character design. 
We'll look at the specifics of how Rivals achieves this in future parts, but suffice to say, the game is still complex and demanding at a high level. You'll need to put in a lot of work if you want to become a truly great player. But Rivals' creation of a lower skill floor, while consciously adding new elements to the platform fighter formula to keep things deep and engaging, is one of the biggest reasons why the game is such an engaging, competitive experience. Adam Kara actually made a great breakdown on this concept in this video that he put out a while back. I'll put a link in the description. Now with all that said, I understand that for a lot of people, the difficulty of a game like Melee is part of the appeal, and honestly, I get it. More power to you. But if you're someone like me, and that has always intimidated you, or just turned you off for whatever reason, then perhaps Rivals might be your cup of tea. Rivals of Ether stands out from the official Smash series in that it has been built from the ground up with competitive play as a primary focus. And as such, it has many traits and features that would be attractive for anybody looking for a well-crafted competitive climate. First off, as one would expect from a modern competitive game, the character roster is very well balanced, with every character seeing a good amount of representation at the highest levels of tournament play. With how much each character has going for them, there's a lot of diversity and creativity in how to play different matchups and what tools are best used in certain ones. Thanks to a long history of thoughtful balancing alongside creative metagame development, every character has a viable place in the metagame, and you can see success playing as whoever you want. Stage design has also been tailored for competitive play. Each of the 15 stages is used in the competitive stage list, which features a diverse set of platform layouts and stage sizes, allowing for a variety of options to suit your preferences. Rivals also builds a very good learning environment. There's a selection of effective tutorials and a feature-rich training mode, which allows players to learn how the game works and practice certain situations and techniques with relative ease. Netplay, which is another essential factor to a modern fighting game, is also pretty solid. In comparison to other platform fighters, it's not quite up to the level of Slippy with its fancy new rollback, but it's far better than any official offerings from Nintendo, especially with the revamp coming with Definitive Edition. There's also been this phenomenal connection between Rivals' developers and its player base. It's truly unlike anything that I've seen before in the platform fighter space. They're very in tune with the needs of their community, and it's clear that they're passionate about their competitive scene and want it to grow as best as it possibly can. They've developed an official esports circuit, They've contributed directly to large tournaments, and have been very supportive of grassroots events and local scenes. So, Rivals has all of these different aspects going for it. But there's a more intrinsic difference that I'd like to address. Smash, for all of its innovation, is still kind of tied down to its own legacy. Characters in Smash have to play in a manner that resembles their original appearance in other games, or even in previous Smash titles. And while the Smash team has done some clever and brilliant adaptations of some of gaming's most treasured icons, there's still an inherent limit to what you can explore with character design when working with existing designs in this way. This is true even if you look at something like Project M. While that game does make a number of deviations from an official Smash game, it's still based on the same fundamental framework of Smash's character and gameplay designs. Not to mention, Smash Bros. is also an established gameplay system, one which has sold millions upon millions of copies by now. So, it doesn't make too much sense for the development team to deviate too much from its primarily casual party game roots, because that's the core of their audience at the end of the day. Rivals, with its original characters and IP, gets a chance to break these conventions established by the platform fighter pioneers. As such, the developers have shown that they haven't been afraid to make bold decisions with their game and create something truly special. With wild characters, wholly new gameplay mechanics, and a willingness to experiment that Smash Brothers itself simply can't allow for. <music> Lastly, I'd like to touch on the Rivals of Ether community. From my experience, Rivals has been one of the best gaming communities that I've been a part of. Like any dedicated competitive scene, they're very passionate about the game they play. And the atmosphere of every big Rivals event that I've attended has just been so incredibly vibrant and spirited, it's honestly pretty infectious. Of course, compared to something like Smash, especially Melee or Ultimate, Rivals' community is definitely significantly smaller than a massive cultural phenomenon like, you know, Super Frickin' Smash Brothers. But I would argue that this smaller size and long-time status as an outsider scene has bred a sense of togetherness and pride that I haven't experienced in any other gaming community. And I've made plenty of friends in my time here that I expect to keep for many years to come. The development team and other community leaders have helped cultivate a welcoming and healthy climate for players to socialize in and connect with one another. And the grassroots energy has managed to stay strong and vibrant throughout the scene's continued growth. 
I can't say it enough. If you can look past the smaller scope that the rival scene has in comparison to the bigger esports out there, I am 100% confident that you'll find a community that's truly special, and I wouldn't trade the world for it. So, with all that said, hopefully that gives you a little context as to why Rivals is so beloved by so many players, myself included, and hopefully it helped convince you to give the game a shot. This will conclude part one of this series. Coming up next will be part two, where we will dive deeper into how Rivals of Aether's mechanics work and how they shape how the game is played. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you around. Take care, y'all.